This is the first introductory tutorial on uh, GNU Radio and more specifically on GNU Radio Companion, uh, the graphical user interface accompanying uh, the GNU Radio software defined radio library uh, for processing radio frequency signals. I'm Jean Michel Fried, I'm from Besançon in France, and here is my email address in case you wish to uh, have complementary information about uh, the content of this tutorial. So GNU Radio Companion uh, is a graphical user interface that will allow us to assemble uh, signal processing blocks uh, uh, without uh, actually getting into uh, writing uh, Python code uh, since this is the language that will allow us to stream data from one processing block to another. Now it might be useful to understand uh, all the subtleties of uh, GNU Radio Companion and the parameters that are uh, provided here to remember uh, some of the basics of radio frequency signal processing. Software defined radio is about uh, digital signal processing of radio frequency signals. So in an uh, analog architecture, we would have an antenna with some uh, analog processing, say for example, gain, and this signal would be transposed to a lower frequency. But because this mixer has some flows, um, we need to uh, remove some of the unwanted frequency components. So we might introduce an intermediate frequency so that we can filter out all the unwanted frequency components. And following this uh, uh, signal, analog signal processing, we complete uh, frequency transposition to baseband, baseband being defined as the frequency range centered on zero hertz. Throughout this presentation, we will be uh, processing baseband signals. And once we get uh, at baseband, we might, for example, uh, demodulate an AM signal using uh, a diode and a rectifier uh, with a low pulse filter, or we might uh, demodulate an FM signal by using a phase lock loop. So all these analog signal processing steps that will require that you take your soldering iron, your oscilloscope, and that you check all the functionalities of your analog signal processing. Now the dream of software defined radio is to replace all this processing with software, which is uh, stable, reproducible, and flexible over time. And this dream of software defined radio is best uh, achieved by considering an antenna connected to an analog to digital converter so that all processing is completed in the digital world. Now this architecture is hardly accessible at the moment because uh, this will be a radio frequency signal reaching the antenna. The antenna is actually a bandpass filter. Uh, it has a finite bandwidth. And this radio frequency signal will be sampled uh, using the uh, meeting the, the criterion of uh, the Shannon sampling theorem that the sampling frequency must be at least twice uh, the highest component of the frequency that we are addressing here. And the challenge at the moment is that high uh, frequency, radio frequency, uh, analog to digital converter exhibit low uh, digitization quantization, so the number of bits n uh, of a quantization. And because the dynamic range is given uh, by the um, uh, quantization uh, rate, so if we have n uh, bits, then we have steps of 2 to the minus n, and the dynamic range is 20 log of this uh, 2 to the minus n. So for 8 bits, this is only 48 dB. So this means that the weakest signal must be no lower than 48 dB than the strongest signal in the band. So if, for example, you were to address a GPS signal at 1.5 gigahertz, but you had the FM band at 100 megahertz, then chances are that your uh, weakest signal will be much lower than the uh, strongest signal in this band. So the current uh, implementation of software defined radio is an intermediate step where we have an antenna. This antenna will usually be fitted with a variable gain amplifier to match the uh, uh, voltage range that can be acquired by the A to D converter. And this signal will be transposed to baseband prior to sampling by the A to D converter. Now this time we have two very 
different quantities. We have the radio frequency signal here that is transposed to baseband using the local oscillator and this signal is then sampled using uh, the sampling rate fs with a resolution n and the digital domain processing will occur uh, after this, uh, this digitization. So if we were to draw the spectrum the signal is located around uh, the radio frequency signal here is located at a given uh, frequency which occupies a given bandwidth and we will tune the local oscillator so that this signal is brought to baseband so this local oscillator FLO will bring the signal to baseband and the sampling rate must be large enough to be at least uh, larger, wider than the bandwidth. So the FS here will be the sampling rate of the A to D converter. So we see here that the local oscillator and the sampling frequency are two very different quantities. One indicates the carrier uh, and the other one indicates the bandwidth. So these two quantities must not be mixed during digital signal processing. So if we consider uh, GNU Radio Companion, this uh, sampling rate here uh, will be tackled by this variable SEMP rate. Now the sampling rate is a quantity that will be used throughout the flowchart and this is why it's a global variable uh, because any time the sampling rate is changed the whole signal processing uh, chain will be uh, uh, modified. So this variable is actually a Python variable. Uh, throughout uh, using New Radio Companion we'll see that we will be naming variables and these names can be reused exactly as you would do in Python and here the sampling rate is defined a default value of 32,000 sample per second which is uh, audio band of course for radio frequency band the sampling uh, bandwidth will be much wider than this. So we can try to uh, create a synthetic signal uh, by uh, clicking on the magnifying glass. We see here that we have all these blocks that appear and these blocks will uh, have many functionalities. Now you might spend a lot of time uh, figuring out which block is doing what but it's easier to actually search if for example I want a signal source well I can just type signal and it will display all the uh, blocks that uh, uh, start with the name signal or that include the name signal. So here I include the signal source and if I double click on the signal source we see here that the signal source will produce separate sample per second. So this is the quantization in the time domain. Furthermore we can select various quantities uh, representing the data that are generated. We can generate bytes, which in the C naming convention are 8-bit integers, short, uh, which are 16-bit integers, or integers, which are 32-bit wide, or floating point number. So we can select one of these quantities and we see here that depending on the uh, variable that is generated on the type of data that is generated the color of the output here is changing. Now we might wonder what is the uh, color coding convention in New Radio Companion and help types will give us uh, the various types of data that can be handled by uh, GNU Radio. So we see here that we have floating point number, uh, real valued number uh, encoded on 32 bits we will see a little bit later why it is natural for software defined radio to process complex numbers, complex in the sense uh, real part, imaginary part, and we have the various integers, 8-bit integers, 16-bit integers, or 32-bit integers. So the various uh, variables that can be handled by new radio companion are color encoded, and you might, for example, wish to display the time domain output which is what an oscilloscope would do. If you hit time in the search uh, bar here you see that you have the cute graphical user interface time sync which means I can create uh, an oscilloscope output of the quantity. Most important 
the output sampling rate must be equal to the input sampling rate. GNU Radio and GNU Radio Companion will not handle uh, sampling rate consistency for you. It's your task to make sure that this uh, sampling rate is consistent throughout the flowchart and that will be part of the discussion in this tutorial. If I were to connect this uh, floating point number output to this complex input, the red arrow indicates a mismatch in the nature of the data that are uh, connected to each other. So I need to double click on this block and select a floating point number, real valued number, as opposed to a complex number. Once a flowchart has been assembled, I can try to run it. Now at the moment I am told this is uh, the sign that tells me that there is an error and the error is that there is no title yet that has been entered uh, in the option uh, here. So if I double click on the option we see that the default identifier is not allowed. This will be the name of a Python script that will be generated. So let's say this is the first lab session and if I apply this I can uh, then execute the flowchart. We see here we have multiple options. We can have Qt graphical interface, uh, GNU Radio and GNU Radio Companion are well suited to run on embedded systems with no graphical interface and in that case you would select a no graphical user interface output and you can create a hierarch hierarchical block where uh, you will integrate multiple blocks in one hierarchy. So this will be more advanced blocks. At the moment we have a Qt graphical use interface uh, block and once I've selected the ID I can actually save uh, the block or if I don't save automatically uh, GNU Radio will ask me to save the data so I save this in a writable directory for Microsoft Windows user be aware that the default selection of the binary location of new radio is not writable under Windows 10, so you need to select a directory you have write access to, otherwise you will not be able to run your, your flow graph. Having done that, we can execute and we get a warning from GNU Radio Companion stating there is no hardware flow control in this flowchart. What does this mean? This means that we have define the sampling rate and indeed new radio uh, is displaying the sample that we created the cosine at 1k hertz uh, with its uh, one millisecond period however new radio does not know what time is and because there is no hardware source or hardware sync it tries to generate data as fast as it can meaning that it will overload your cpu so in this case uh, when there is no uh, input or output hardware peripheral as is the case in the simulation simulated data that we'll be using you need to introduce an additional throttle block the throttle block will make sure that you generate as many data as um, indicated in the sampling rate uh, the throttle block does not claim to have accuracy, it just aims at not overloading your CPU by generating as many data as GNU Radio can handle per time unit. So once I've added my throttle block here, I can restart and here is my time domain oscilloscope to display uh, the sine wave that was generated by uh, GNU Radio uh, in this example. Whenever I want to change options, I can uh, middle click on the uh, mouse button and that will allow me to change uh, the various parameters of, uh, of the display. I can add uh, markers if I wish to have some uh, actual uh, visualization of the sampling rate, this kind of, of element. Right click will bring you back to the original uh, scale. Now let's say that in addition to time domain oscilloscope I wish to add the uh, frequency component well then I would just ask for a, a cute graphical user interface frequency sync and that will allow me to add a spectrum analyzer again because these are floating point number I'm not allowed to connect a complex sync so I need to modify to a floating point number again the sampling rate here is consistent with the output data rate of the signal source so that when I execute this uh, spectrum analyzer 
I have the x-axis, the frequency axis, that is properly labeled. Uh, I'm generating 32 kilo samples per second, meaning that the spectrum spans from minus 16 to plus 16 kilohertz. This is minus half the sampling rate, the Nyquist frequency, to half the sampling rate plus the Nyquist frequency, and here I have the uh, free spectral component at one kilohertz. Of course, we've generated a cosine. If you if you remind the, remember that cosine of x is proportional to exponential of minus x, uh, which is the uh, 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 an uh, even function. So I have uh, exponential of minus jx uh, with uh, the cosine, the even part, and sine, the 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 odd part, and if I want to get rid of the uh, odd part, I will add this this term here. So this means I have plus x and minus x, and these two quantities are the two uh, spectral component at minus one kilohertz and plus one kilohertz that we have here. So this allows you to first have your first insight in uh, the digital signal processing of discrete time, uh, discretized samples. This is a static uh, behavior, which is a bit boring because we only have this uh, one kilohertz signal. And if we want to make it a bit more dynamic, we might want to create dynamic variables. So how do we create variables? Well, let's say, for example, we want to change the frequency and we wish the frequency not to be defined by uh, this constant, but we want it to be a variable that we will call freq. Now, this freq variable, if I just uh, select this block like this, will become red because freq is not defined. Freq is a Python variable which has not been defined. So we can create a variable. And this variable block here, I just typed var, and this variable block here will allow me to create the freq variable. The name of the Python variable is defined in the ID and the value will be defined in this quantity here. So if now I select this value, we see here that the frequency has been set despite being defined by this frequency here. We now have the value 440 hertz, which is the value that I indicated here. And if I now run this flow graph, we see that we indeed have the 440 hertz uh, values that are defined over here. So now we've defined a variable, and this variable can be reused multiple times throughout the flowchart. Now this will be most convenient whenever, as usual in programming, uh, a quantity appears multiple times throughout a, a flowchart, and this will be used later uh, in various uh, processing steps. However, this means that at the moment the flowchart is still static. We would like to make it a bit more dynamic. So for make to make the uh, dynamically varying frequency, we can ask for a widget, which is the cute graphical user interface range. If we want to make it dynamically tunable, I select this cute graphical user interface dynamic range. And again, in the identifier, I give the name of the variable. So the, ni the name of the variable is this freq variable that we had earlier. And well, let's say this is an audio frequency. So we have a default value of 440 Hertz, a starting frequency of zero Hertz DC. And because this is discrete time uh, sample signal, we're only allowed to go up to SEMP rate divided by two, uh, the Nyquist frequency have a sampling rate. So you see here already where variables are most useful. Whenever I will change the sampling rate here, the uh, uh, threshold of this uh, range uh, block will change accordingly. Now, if I select the variable like this, I'm already warned that the ID frequency is not unique. And indeed, we have two definitions of frequency that conflict. You're not allowed to create twi twice a variable with the same name. So we need to comment out this variable. And commenting a block is achieved by unplugging the block. So this uh, function here will comment. And if you see the block becoming dark gray, it means it's been commented out. Now we can execute uh, 
And in addition to having a static uh, uh, simulation here, we can dynamically change the frequency. And we see that by dynamically changing uh, this uh, range uh, position here, we can change the frequency, which of course reflects in the time domain and in the frequency domain. So this will be uh, one of the uh, uh, benefits of New Radio Companion with respect to MATLAB or Octave or Python uh, software-defined radio post-processing. We have real-time dynamic access to the variables uh, defining the flowchart, making the simulation much more dynamic than what we would have with uh, MATLAB or, or Python. Be aware that these are Python variables and as such they are case dependent. If I include the frequency with a capital F, uh, it will not be the same as this frequency here. So make sure to have the same writing for your variables. So we've just seen that uh, real valued quantities uh, have an uh, even spectrum with the positive part and negative part uh, magnitude of the Fourier transform being equal. This is a flowchart with floating point numbers and we mentioned earlier that it's natural for software defined radio to handle complex numbers. Now why is it that software defined radio handles complex quantities with an imaginary part? If we remember the architecture of the receiver we have an antenna with its uh, preamp, analog preamp, and this signal is transposed from its radio frequency band to its base band by mixing with a source at frequency LO. And by doing this, we bring the signal to base band, which is readily digitized by the A to Z converter with a bandwidth, a bandwidth uh, FS sampling rate to be processed in the digital domain. Now, imagine that this radio frequency signal is an amplitude times the cosine of angular frequency at radio frequency, uh, angular frequency times t, and that there is a phase. This uh, expression allows me to emphasize uh, the free modulation quantities, the amplitude modulation, the frequency modulation, or the phase modulation. So let's say that we have an amplitude modulation uh, on the signal, which would be the case for all aircraft or uh, airborne signal uh, transfer. Now we wish to recover the time-dependent amplitude which carries the information. So we mix frequency RF with uh, the local oscillator and by mixing this cosine and this local oscillator which we can express as a unit amplitude cosine of po uh, angular uh, frequency omega LO times t, times t then if we mix these two cosines we end up with the sum and the different frequencies cosine times cosine will create something of a shape cosine of omega RF Ta times plus phi multiplied by cosine of angular uh, frequency or local oscillator times t will create something proportional to cosine of omega difference and we get rid of the sum term by using a low pass filter. So the terms uh, omega RF plus omega local oscillator times T is a high frequency signal because both omega RF and omega local oscillator are high, high frequency quantities and this will be uh, cancelled uh, by a low pass filter. So we're left with omega RF minus omega LO times T plus phi and if we uh, lock on the carrier frequency, meaning that if omega R, uh, local oscillator is equal to omega RF, then the time varying terms here cancelled and we're we are left with the output of the mixer of a shape cosine phi multiplied by the amplitude that was in the beginning over here, 
the term that we want to recover which is all very fine as long as phi is not equal as pi over 2. If phi equals 0, which is good because then cosine of phi equals 1 and we get the amplitude. Unfortunately, if phi equals pi over 2, then cosine of phi equals 0 and we get an output of 0, whatever is a, the amplitude that we wish to demodulate. So this means that every time the signal goes through uh, pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2, we cancel the output. This might not happen very often. Well, actually imagine that you have a FM band signal. So the FM broadcast commercial band is around 100 megahertz. And remember that the wavelength of a signal is 300 divided by its frequency in megahertz. That's the speed of light, 310 to the 8 meter per second, divided by the frequency in hertz. If I cancel 10 to the 6 uh, on uh, numerator and denominator, I am left with 300 over the frequency in megahertz. So this means that the wavelength is 3 meter for uh, FM commercial broadcast uh, signal. So this means that lambda over 4, which is pi over 4, uh, pi over 2 over here is, so this is the equivalent of 2 pi. So if I take quarter wavelength, which means 2 pi divided by 4 is pi over 2, that will be 75 centimeters. So this means that every time we're mocking uh, at 75 centimeters, we have pi over 2. At uh, 1 meter 50 we have pi so that cosine is minus 1 we can recover the amplitude but then at 2 meter 25 we're back to the condition where we lose the phase. So this means that when we're walking listening to a FM broadcast frequency band and we were to decode an AM modulation signal every time we walk by a meter and a half we would be losing the amplitude which is of course not acceptable. So we need to find a trick to recover the phase even when these uh, terms here, pi over 2, uh, cancels the cosine. And the obvious solution is to say, let's try to make another quantity so that the sign of this quantity appears. And how do you make the sign appear over here? Well, the trick is to say, we take the local oscillator here, which is cosine, and we try to create a new local oscillator which is this time sine of omega uh, local oscillator times t. If now I have a term sine in my quantity here, then you create the new mixing of cosine of omega LOT plus phi multiplied by uh, omega RF multiplied by sine of omega LOT. And this cosine multiplied by sine will create something that is proportional to a sine of phi. So where we had previously the a cosine of phi when mixing a cosine with a cosine, this time mixing the cosine with a sine create the sine of phi. And this is fine because this new quantity that we just created is cancelled when phi equals zero, but that doesn't matter because the first quantity that we create is this maximum when phi equals zero. And on the other hand, when phi equals pi over two, this quantity vanished, but this new quantity that we created, sinus of pi over two is one, and uh, this quantity will be maximized. So we need two local oscillators shifted by 90 degrees because sine and cosine will be shifted. If you look at your trigonometric circle, the cosine and the sine are shifted by 90 degrees. So how do we create the cosine and the sine? Well, we actually take the local oscillator here and we shift it by 90 degrees to create a new local oscillator with which the signal here will be mixed to create a second quantity. And these two quantities which I will draw a bit better on a blank sheet of paper now. So we have the oscillator, which is the local oscillator, which received a signal that was amplified for mixing. So we have a first mixer 
that will be directly addressed by the local oscillator and we will have a second mixer this time that will take the same quantity here but this time a phase shifted copy of the local oscillator here by pi over 2 and these two quantities here will be sampled this time by a two channel A to D converter at sampling rate Fs and these two quantities that will be output will be called the identity quantity because it's been mixing the radio frequency signal with the local oscillator and the second quantity with the quadrature shifted local oscillator will be the Q quantity. We've just seen earlier that this will be addressed as A of cosine the phase, this will be A sine the phase so you see that we have the usual uh, relation that says that the amplitude is the square root of a squared plus q squared and the phase is arctangent of q over i. So this means that the i and q coefficient meet all the criterion of the algebra of complex numbers and this is why we'll naturally express this quantity as i plus jq with j squared equal minus 1. So this is the reason why it's natural for software-defined radio to handle e complex quantities with a real part and an imaginary part which are the two quadrature components. So if now I am to change all these blocks to go back to floating point from floating point to complex numbers, so I will change everything back to their default value of a floating point number well, we see now that if we run this uh, flowchart, we will get again uh, the uh, time domain and frequency domain quantities. But this time, the time domain is characterized by two values. These two values here, you can actually remove one by clicking on the symbol, are in quadrature, uh, pi over 2, 90 degree uh, phase shift. And this time, the spectral components is a unique value, a unique spectral component. Indeed, prior to this analysis, we mentioned that the cosine of x is uh, exponential of jx minus exponential of minus jx, and because this is the odd quantity that we want to remove, it's plus. And on the other hand, this complex number here is, expect, is expressed as exponential of j angular frequency omega t, so that now we have a unique spectral component omega, which is this guy over here. So we see now that this frequency can go positive, but now it also makes sense to have negative frequencies, because we have i and q that define what negative frequency means. So this time the q's graphical interface range will not go from 0 to sample rate over 2, but from minus the Nyquist rate to plus the Nyquist rate and that's minus sampling frequency to plus half the sampling frequency. So this time we have a negative frequency which is not the same as the positive frequency. Now would be a time if you wish to rehearse and make sure that everything that we've been discussing so far is working properly on your computer, uh, the time to pause the video and to check by yourself. Good. So now we have this first synthetic flowchart running with the time domain and frequency domain uh, values uh, simulated by GNU Radio Companion. Now we wish to introduce one of the core topics of software-defined radio processing and that is decimation. What is decimation? The idea of decimation is that throughout the processing chain uh, on the receiver side we can only lose information. Uh, we cannot create new information on the receiver side, we can only waste information as we are going further in the processing chain and doing more fancy analysis. Now, uh, Shannon uh, information theorem tells us that uh, the, the quantity of information and the bandwidth are closely related. So that if we lose information, it means that we can lower the bandwidth. Another way of mentioning this is that here we have a spectrum 
and maybe we've removed some of the information from the uh, data that were analyzed and we wish to zoom into the spectrum. What does zooming into the spectrum uh, mean? Well, if we wish to uh, magnify the frequency range, it means that we will reduce the sampling uh, band. If we initially had a signal that was going from half minus half the sampling frequency of the minus Nyquist rate to the positive uh, Nyquist threshold, then if we wish to zoom into the uh, spectrum, you see here that we had a finite number of samples, in this case it's an FFT on 1024 samples. Well, if I want to go from this uh, whole bandwidth over n equals 1024 samples, meaning that the frequency resolution, the bin width, is equal to the sampling frequency divided by n. If I want to reduce the bin width, well, one way of doing this is to say I will go from uh, minus fs over 2d to fs over 2d, so I will reduce the uh, bandwidth. And by doing this, by decimating by a factor of d, I will now have a bin width or frequency resolution of fs over n times d, of course, d great integer number greater than 1. Actually, not necessarily integer, but most classically integer. So what does it mean to actually decimate? When we had our continuous time signal, we had created a discretized time domain signal by sampling every uh, sampling every TS, which is the uh, sampling period, which by definition is 1 over the sampling frequency. If I now wish to reduce the number of samples per second, meaning I wish to actually decimate by a factor of d, that would mean keeping only one sample every so many, and in this particular case I'm decimating by a factor of 4 here by only keeping one out of four sample. So this is an example of decimation by removing three out of four samples and only keeping one out of four samples. So by doing this I will reduce the bandwidth and if I have a given number of samples it means I will improve the uh, resolution. So how do we actually demonstrate this in GNU Radio? Well in GNU Radio I can perform this operation by keeping one in n samples. So I will keep one in n samples and actually in my demonstration here n, uh, the quantity n here will be the variable d that I just used in my in my uh, chart here. So we connect this new uh, block here but because we only keep one in n sample we need to reduce the number of samples reaching the time domain and frequency domain sync. We will no longer have 32,000 samples per second, we will only keep one in n. So if we decimate by a factor of d, then it means that we end up with separate divided by d samples per second in the time domain and same in the uh, frequency domain. Now the reason why I'm creating a variable d is that d will be used in three places in the flowchart and if I change in one place I want to make sure that the whole flowchart is consistent. This is why I created this variable earlier, now I will remove the freq naming and I will create a d variable and let's say we wish to decimate by a factor of 4. So I create this variable d which is now uh, a decimation by a factor of 4, I activate the block, if you've unplugged a block then you can connect it again by plugging the block and we see that all the blocks become uh, black again, meaning we can run the flowchart. If we execute this flowchart, 
we see now that the x-axis of the frequency domain, the spectrum, is no longer from minus 16 to 16 kilohertz, minus Nyquist rate to, to the Nyquist rate, but we see now that the decimation by 4 has reduced by 4 the, the band here. So now if we move the frequency range, we can go throughout the uh, spectrum over here, but if we no longer meet the sampling criterion, meaning that the higher frequency will go beyond the frequency at the output of a decimator, we have here a demonstration of what it means to have uh, a discrete time periodic spectrum. What does this mean? It means that the assumption under uh, discretized sampling rate is that the spectrum is periodic. It means that whatever we have in the frequency content over here is reproduced over here and is reproduced over here. So that whenever a spectral component leaves on one side the spectrum, it will enter the next Nyquist zone over here and going to the second Nyquist zone, upper Nyquist zone here, is like coming back from the lower Nyquist zone over here. So this is what we demonstrate with this example. I can shift the frequency and we see on the bottom chart here that the peak is going from one Nyquist zone to another and going back in baseband because only signals at baseband can be represented in discrete time signal processing. Now this is a hindrance because imagine that as you are decimating you had previously a spectral component over here and you just decimate by keeping one in D samples. Well, this signal here has no reason of disappearing as we're decimating. It will be found back in baseband due to aliasing. Aliasing is the result of this hypothesis of periodic uh, uh, spectrum where this uh, quantity here will be found back as an image in baseband following the decimation. So either you use efficiently uh, upper Nyquist zone, so you use uh, efficiently uh, aliasing, or you wish to get rid of aliasing. And to get to make sure that you eliminate any risk of aliasing, you must make sure that you cancel any signal in the upper part of the spectrum prior to uh, decimating. So this means that we need to introduce one new additional block prior to decimating and that will be a low pass filter. We need to low pass filter the signal prior to decimating. So let's try to do this. If we remove here, uh, we put the throttle block like this. We go to a low pass filter to clean the signal from any unwanted spectral component and once we've cleaned the signal from all the unwanted spectral component then we can process the uh, decimated signal. The question is what is the low pass filter and uh, the, the cutoff frequency and the transition width? How do we, how do we parameterize a low pass filter? So we have a few parameters. We have the input data rate. We see here that we have sample rate per second, which is correct because we feed the low pass filter with the output of a signal source. We have a cutoff frequency and we have a transition width. So let's first address the cutoff frequency. We'll discuss the transition width a bit later. So the cutoff frequency, we see here that we need to get rid of any spectral component that is between fs over 2d the decimation factor and fs over 2. So this means that the cutoff frequency we need to only keep data in this frequency band and remove all these guys in this frequency band. So this means that we will select uh, a cutoff frequency of sample rate divided by 2 divided by d. That's your fs divided by 2 over here divided by d and because a low pass filter in the complex domain is symmetric with respect to the zero hertz here this is indeed a low pass filter so we see here the low pass filter and at the moment let us just write here uh, 
separate over 64. We'll discuss later what this means. So at the moment, we wish to know what is the cutoff frequency, and the cutoff frequency must be separate uh, over 2 over d, which is this cutoff frequency over here. And now, what happens when we do this? Well, now when we run this flowchart, we see that as we are increasing the frequency, of course, the signal comes out of the first uh, Nyquist zone of the baseband, but when we go in the second Nyquist zone, we see the impact of a low pass uh, filter where the output is only uh, something like minus 80 dB. Remember, this is a very clean signal. This is why within baseband you are at minus 10 dB. This is uh, not power, but it's relative power. So we've dropped by about 60 to 70 dB the signal in the upper Nyquist zones. This is, of course, the case also for the lower Nyquist zone when we reach when we leave the baseband uh, from the negative frequency, again, we cancel the unwanted frequency component. So very important, whenever you want to decimate, make sure that you low pass filter prior to decimation. And once you've decimated, then you can, once you've low pass filter, then you can decimate. Now, this set of operations of low pass filtering and decimating is so common that actually the low pass filter actually includes the decimation factor so that you don't need to separate keep one in end the decimation and low pass filtering you can get rid of the keep one in end and actually decimate over here by a factor of d and that will be exactly the same thing as we were just running previously so having the low pass filter and the decimation by a factor of uh, a D here. And again, we get the exact same result as before with this uh, baseband signal that is uh, vanishing in the upper and lower Nyquist zone. Let us now address the question of the transition width. This is a very important quantity. How to select the transition width? Imagine that you wish to define a filter. So let's say we have a frequency range and prior to decimation, this is the power here from minus Nyquist uh, frequency to plus Nyquist frequency. And let's say we wish to define a low pass filter with its cutoff frequency as we've just seen previously, but also its transition width. This transition width here that we will call delta F is the rate at which the uh, power drops and because this is a low pass filter it will be symmetric on the negative side of the uh, frequency range. How do we select delta F? This is the transition width. Delta F is selected with the resolution of the Fourier transform. If we have an N sample Fourier transform because there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the frequency domain and the time domain of uh, the representation of signal, then n samples in the frequency domain are represented as n samples in the time domain, and uh, the one-to-one -one relationship here is the inverse or direct Fourier transform. In the time domain, the filter whose uh, transfer function is drawn as this function here will be expressed as a finite impulse response filter which has the advantage of uh, being unconditionally stable because it's a finite impulse response meaning that if I stop feeding at some point the filter with data then its uh, output will vanish to zero and this is a convolution that is expressed as output as a given time is uh, a weighted sum of the inputs uh, in the past time. So this is one expression of uh, the finite impulse response. How could you interpret this? Well, if we want to make a low pass filter, low pass filtering, an intuitive way of saying that we low pass filter is averaging. If we average, if we have a sliding average, that means that a quickly varying signal will be smoothed by the uh, sliding average 
and this will act as a low pass filter. So how do you express averaging? Well, averaging is expressed as 1 over Q and the sum of the uh, Q values that we had before BK. So this is an unweighted average. This is just simply the uh, 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 sum of past values. And we can make this a bit more fancy. This is not B, this is X past value, past inputs, and we can make the filter more fancy to define actually its shape beyond a sign cardinal to have this weight B. So the question might be how to select this quantity Q here, the number of samples in the time domain. Remember, this here is in the time domain, which is a one-to-one -one relationship with the frequency domain that we have over here. So in the time domain, we need to select the number of samples that will allow us to meet the expectation that we drive in the frequency domain. If I want to define a filter with a delta F transition, it means I mean I need to have at least one definition of the frequency domain over here and one over here. And because the frequency resolution is the whole uh, range Fs divided by n the number of samples, it means that this fs over n must be smaller than the frequency step delta f that we have here. If we want to have at least one sample uh, every delta f, then fs over n, the bin resolution in the frequency domain, must be smaller than delta f. Which means if I put n over here, then n must be bigger then fs over delta f. This will give you the order of magnitude of uh, the number of coefficients here. But this number of coefficients here is the same quantity that we called q over here because this one-to-one -one relationship between time domain and frequency domain representation means that the number q of samples here must be greater than the sampling, fr sampling frequency divided by delta f. And this is very important because you often see on the mailing lists of, of the GNU Radio mailing list people asking how come that uh, GNU Radio is so slow and inefficient and unable to implement the filter they wanted. The problem is not with GNU Radio but with the uh, uh, offer of the filter by using uh, unrealistic expectation on the delta F over here. If you are operating, let's say, at 32,000 samples per second and you say my transition width must be 1 hertz, then you will create uh, a filter because GNU Radio tries to comply with the filter definition that you give here with 32,000 samples. This means that each output will require 32,000 multiplication if you take the naive approach of a time domain convolution uh, and even if you take the Fourier domain uh, approach with the FFT you will need uh, far too many multiplication to be handled by uh, modern CPUs. So selecting a delta F transition width with a reasonable number of coefficients, the so-called taps, the number of taps is the number of coefficients, uh, the number Q here in this convolution of a finite impulse response sphere, and selecting a reasonable delta F here means that Q will remain reasonable and within computational capability of uh, modern CPU. So this is the reason why I selected 64 here. You see that if I select delta F, the transition width, F sampling rate divided by 64, this means that here I've selected delta F as Fs over 64, meaning that now Fs over delta F is by definition equal to 64. So I actually selected the number of taps in this expression here. So actually GNU Radio comes with a very nice tool for uh, understanding these this topics. It's called the Filter Design Tool. It's really an amazing little piece of software that allows you to uh, have an intuitive understanding of how a uh, finite impulse response filter behave. This tool here allows you to define the parameters of your filter, 
and to watch the various uh, results. So let's take the default uh, parameters, uh, uh, the 320 kilo sample per second, and let's take this default configuration uh, where uh, rather than discussing about uh, uh, cutoff frequency and transition width, they talk about end of band pass and start of stop band. So if I take my drawing again, I have a filter with its uh, low pass uh, quantity that will be so if I plot the uh, power as a function of frequency and uh, this here is where I would put the cutoff frequency and this is uh, the transition width uh, at a, a given uh, attenuation so the start of, uh, of the stop band so if we start with a default configuration and we run this we see that we get something like uh, 10 kilohertz over 320 uh, kilo sample per second uh, from my previous analysis that would have meant about uh, 32 coefficients we see that we have 59 coefficients here is the frequency domain response and we'll look a little bit later at the time domain response at the moment what I'm interested in is let's say that we have the transition width half the transition width means I bring the stop band closer to the pass band so let's say 55 kilo sample. So instead of 10 kilohertz, I now, ha now have 5 kilohertz. And if I design again, we see that the 59 coefficient have raised to 117. We can do this again by saying let's have again the uh, transition width by uh, uh, decreasing from 5 kilohertz to 2.5 kilohertz. And again, if I design again, we see that we go from 117 to 233. Of course, we have a sharper transition, but at the cost of a greater number of coefficients, greater number of taps. And finally, this one-to-one -one relation bet that I mentioned earlier between the frequency domain and time domain can be illustrated between the number of taps and how sharp the transition is. The taps are actually nicely interpreted. This is the uh, time domain response. So this is the B in uh, Y equals sum of uh, B K X N minus K, uh, the past values of X inputs. And if I go back to the original uh, uh, 55,000 uh, coefficients uh, we see here we go back to 117 and back to the initial value of 60 uh, what we see actually here is that these taps these time domain coefficients are the uh, impulse response of the uh, frequency domain so this relationship between filter taps is if you run a Dirac function into this uh, frequency domain uh, filter, then you end up with uh, impulse response, which are these B coefficients uh, in your field filter. So uh, play with uh, the uh, filter design tool. It will make uh, the various parameters much more intuitive. Uh, uh, cutoff frequency and uh, the transition width is the distance between the end of a pass band and the start of a stop band. And uh, this number of taps will be, of course, driven by how quickly you allow your uh, uh, filter to drop and the uh, rules remain the same. Uh, once I've selected the attenuation, you see that if I have a transition width, I double the number of uh, taps. And again, if I do it once more, we see again that 59 will become 108, uh, 117. So uh, to play with these various parameters so that we have an intuitive uh, uh, display of what the uh, taps are and how the fear filter behaves. So what we've done so far is we have this throttle block, we've got the low pass filter, and we've got this queued graphical interface time domain frequency uh, sync. Let's comment out at the moment the time domain sync. And let's consider a low pass filter that does not exactly match uh, the uh, criterion for cleaning uh, before decimation, but let's uh, have half this quantity. So let's consider a filter that cuts at half the output uh, sampling frequency. So how will this filter behave? Well, if I take this filter and I vary the frequency, we see that once I reach the cutoff frequency, the signal drops. And of course, then we reach the upper Nyquist zone. Uh, by aliasing, we come back to the baseband, but this signal has been attenuated enough that there is very little contribution back to baseband.
So if I wish to plot the transfer function, I can middle click on the mouse and I can hold the maximum. So I can keep the maximum of a spectrum as I am uh, sweeping the frequency and when I reach the transition uh, frequency then the signal drops and we get the transfer function of the, C of, uh, of the filter. And if I remain in the uh, baseband then I can slowly plot the whole transfer function of the, uh, of the filter by uh, memorizing the maximum value and similarly in the negative frequency range. So this is exactly how radio frequency frequency swept network analyzer will operate. They will sweep the local oscillator and analyze around each transmitted frequency the amount of power uh, that is either reflected or returned by, uh, by, by, by the, the filter or whatever device under test is being analyzed. And if I go in the first Nyquist zone and go back by aliasing into the baseband, we see here that this time the signal is very weak and there is at least uh, from minus 9 to minus 70, there is at uh, least 60 dB rejection from this filter. So here we analyze frequency by frequency each component, but uh, maybe we wish to have an instantaneous uh, picture of the transfer function of a filter that is generating a signal with all spectral components at the same time. What is a signal with all the spectral components uh, generated the sp at the same time? Well, uh, a signal with a white uh, uh, spectrum, a flat spectrum, is noise. So let's see how we can characterize a filter transfer function by using noise. To do that, we will replace the signal source here, comment it out, with a noise source. So the noise source will be over here. We wish to characterize uh, the low pass filter over here and we wish to display the spectrum prior to filtering and after filtering. So we can double click on the frequency sync and say we want two inputs. And that will require, if we want to have two inputs, that actually we go back to the uh, solution where uh, we will not decimate the filter because otherwise uh, we would uh, have different uh, data rate between the two inputs of this uh, uh, block and the frequency sync cannot handle, of course, two different uh, sampling rates. We need to have the same sampling rate at both uh, inputs of, uh, of a spectrum analyzer. So we see here we have a low pass filter with its cutoff frequency and we wish to monitor the spectral components of the noise source prior and after filtering. So additionally, because now we removed uh, the decimation factor, we must make sure that we adapt the bandwidth over here, so we remove the decimation factor over here. And if we run this uh, flowchart, I can display uh, the spectrum prior and after um, filtering. And by clicking middle click on the mouse button and averaging, I can make the spectra a bit nicer. Input zero is prior to uh, filtering and input one is after filtering. Uh, and indeed, we see a cutoff frequency of 8 kilohertz, which is indeed the 8 kilohertz that we have here on the spectrum. So now we see how uh, right click on the uh, right mouse button to go back to the original scale. We see here how we could uh, uh, display the transfer function of the filter with uh, uh, only the noise source and no sweep of the signal source, so no need to manually uh, probe each individual frequency. This is how your usual audio frequency uh, FFT uh, analyzer would operate by taking the Fourier transform of a noise source. So now would be again a nice time to stop the video and to check that you have been able to reproduce all the steps or otherwise uh, make sure that you can uh, achieve such a result. Let us conclude now this tutorial with a new flowchart that we wish to demonstrate uh, how to create modulation. So we start with a clean uh, sheet and we wish to uh, demonstrate how to create amplitude modulation. So to create amplitude modulation we need two signal sources 
we need a signal source that will act as the carrier and we need a signal source that will act as the information to be transmitted. So the carrier, uh, because AM uh, will be most easily demonstrated on a real signal, will say we have uh, a 440 Hertz uh, carrier frequency uh, sampled at same rate the default value of 32K. Amplitude modulation is about saying we have a signal that we wish to transmit and this information that we wish to transmit is encoded as the amplitude of the carrier that is being transferred, the ratio of the maximum to the minimum value being the uh, modulation depth. So to do this, we uh, will try to multiply the sine wave of the carrier frequency with its amplitude. So we take, for example, uh, an information that will be, uh, say, at 50 Hertz. And to modulate, we need a floating point number so that we can multiply. So by multiplying, we take an information that is encoded as a uh, cosine of omega carrier times t and we replace this a over here as cosine of omega information times t and because this will become negative which doesn't make sense for an amplitude we take something that is one plus alpha times uh, cosine of t. So this will be the expression of the uh, modulation signal uh, if this term here uh, vanishes to zero, uh, this means that we have a 100% uh, modulation depth and that is unwise because it means that you cannot differentiate uh, transmitting a zero with lack of transmission, so it's wise to have lower modulation depth and to keep uh, alpha below one. So to do this, we will select uh, in the amplitude source an offset, let's say uh, dot three, and an amplitude let's say uh, something that will allow us to have the sum uh, being uh, equal to one, so it's the other way around. I need to select a lower amplitude than the offset to make sure that this guy here always remain above zero. This multiplication is a real point, uh, real data multiplication. Again, remember, if we have no hardware output, I need to put a throttle block, and once I've put the throttle block, I can actually display the output of my amplitude modulator by taking a time domain signal and the time sync again as we did earlier if we want an oscilloscope with two inputs no need to buy a fancier scope we just hit here number of uh, input channels these are floating point numbers and you can connect the output of your amplitude modulator and we wish to check what is the shape of the uh, uh, information we wish to transmit. If she as when you write software, it's a good idea to comment your uh, signal processing flowchart. So in the signal source, if I double click and I go in advanced, I can add comments. This is the carrier signal. I could say this is the information signal and you see that it will make your flowchart much easier to read in the future to remember which is which. So you can put comments in your uh, blocks here. Again, uh, there is no title yet, so let's call this lab session number two. And we need to make sure that we save prior to uh, running. So again, in a writable uh, directory, we save and we run. And here you see that you've got your uh, amplitude uh, modulated signal in blue and the transmitted information in red. Uh, so that's your demonstration of the AM uh, signal modulation using GNU radio. Now this is all very nice, we're transmitting signals uh, uh, virtually, but let's say we wish to now play this on the sound card. So uh, one uh, output that is most common is the audio frequency sync, so let's replace just the oscilloscope with an audio sync. Now remember what I said earlier, if we now have a hardware output, we no longer uh, use the throttle block because throttle means that there is no hardware uh, limiting uh, data rate uh, peripheral. So we 
comment out the follow block and we connect at the output of the multiplication the audio sync and uh, the it's this guy I needed to comment and the and the uh, uh, oscilloscope output but a sound card cannot play 32 samples per 32 kilo sample my sound card can play 44,100 uh, sample per second 48 kilo sample per second 92 or uh, 96 or 192 kilo sample per second so this means I need to change the sampling rate so this is why we use the same variable throughout the flowchart if I now change the sampling rate to 48 48 kilo sample per second everywhere I've used the variable sampling is consistently updated. And if I now play this flowchart, you should be able to hear the amplitude modulated signal at 440 Hertz transmitting the 50 Hertz information. So this demonstrates how you can actually use the, uh, uh, the audio sync as a hardware output to uh, probe the spectral characteristics of the signals you are generating using your radio companion. So I tried to complete this uh, tutorial with only virtual signals, trying to show how we can make uh, all these uh, digital uh, uh, discrete time, uh, discretized sample processing uh, fun and easy to analyze using New Radio Companion. But most of the time we actually wish to benefit from the real-time analysis of real signals. So to conclude this presentation, let us just introduce uh, the OSMOCOM uh, block, which is uh, the hardware for uh, uh, processing these DVB-T signals. So these are the digital video broadcast receiver uh, dongle for less than 10 euros that allow you to collect uh, IQ signals and to stream these IQ signals. So how do we analyze uh, these uh, dongles? Here we have the antenna input uh, over here. So this is where you would connect your antenna. And once you've connected your antenna, you will find over here the uh, radio frequency front end. So if I draw again what was my, uh, this, uh, my signal analysis, I would have the analog amplifier followed by the mixer with the local oscillator bringing the signal to baseband. So this is taken care of by the R820T uh, here and once we've uh, generated the signal we wish to convert using the A to D converter and that is taken care of by the Realtek RTL2832 that is over here and that will create the USB stream with the I and Q data that are transferred over 8-bit uh, samples uh, through the USB. So here you have your USB output, RTL2832, uh, analog to digital converter, and uh, the uh, radio frequency front-end, analog front-end over here. So if we look at this uh, dongle and compare the parameters with uh, the parameters that we have access to in uh, GNU Radio Companion, we see here that we have access to all these parameters. Again, remember, we had here the sampling rate, we had here the gain, the variable gain of the uh, uh, analog front end. This is what you will find here. Sampling rate is this FS over here. The frequency that you find here is the local oscillator that you find over here. And the gain parameter that you find here a little bit lower here in this architecture, there is only a uh, radio frequency analog gain is this value over here. So this is the gain here. In the case of uh, RTL uh, SDR dongles, the sampling frequency is something anywhere between 50 to 1600 megahertz. So that will allow you to record anything from broadcast FM to uh, ISM band uh, in Western Europe, 444 megahertz to uh, GSM, of course we don't have a whole bandwidth, but we can monitor some channels uh, up to ADSB for planes and uh, GPS uh, or Iridium uh, low Earth orbiting satellites, GPS is medium Earth orbiting satellites. Uh, this is absolutely amazing that these 10 euro uh, cheap receivers can actually process 50 watt uh, GPS signal emitted from 20,000 
20,000 kilometers away. The local oscillator has an upper limit uh, from the USB data rate, which is about 2.4 mega sample per second. There is a lower limit that I'm not completely clear with, but uh, anything below about uh, 1 mega sample per second will start losing samples. So keep the sampling rate between 1 and 2.4 mega sample per second. And the uh, gain is something between 0 and 49 dB. So you see that all these parameters that we would be familiar with in the analog domain will be found here in the digital processing block. And this digital processing block will give you uh, the output of a complex number. And this complex valued uh, quantity will, for example, feed a frequency uh, uh, spectrum analyzer and as long as I make sure to have a decent sampling rate which of course at 48,000 will not be applicable with respect to the condition I just met here but here you have the basics to get started with the next tutorial where we will be using actual hardware uh, source to uh, record uh, the uh, uh, broadcast FM signals. So in this tutorial, we introduced uh, the basics of New Radio Companion, we introduced the basic data type, we introduced aliasing and how you need to low pass filter, and finally, how you must make sure to have consistent data rate throughout the decimation blocks uh, of your processing chain.